Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this COVID safe legal compliance session run by Kaizen Synergy Law Firm. My name is Nihal Semara. I'm the General Counsel and Legal Director here at Kaizen Synergy, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's session. Today's session builds upon the previous webinars that we have run and actually repeats the session that we ran from last week due to a public holiday being in uh, some parts of the country last week. So with that, we are going to be looking at service agreements and staff registers. We're also going to be looking at contact tracing and some of the documents that your agency needs to now have as part of the roadmaps and directions from these roadmaps with agencies starting to reopen and reopen to provide services such as group classes, um, such as other support networks to clients, and also look at what you need to consider as part of your work health and safety obligations. We have been approached to provide legal advice over the, over the past few months from agencies from a whole range of community service backgrounds. These include obviously disability services, aged care services, but also food and other enterprise type of uh, services run by charities in terms of their service delivery. What we are seeing is this really uh, real concern that's being expressed by having to try and navigate how do you actually deliver services to clients who may fit into either those that are vaccinated, those that are not vaccinated or unvaccinated, or may they may also have exemptions for any number of reasons as well, or what if they potentially are COVID positive as well? So we have this real mix and this concern expressed by agencies. We're also looking at as part of this, what do you do with your service contract? So where you may have agencies where you provide services to vulnerable people, but you need to engage with other companies. It may be security companies. It may be food services. Um, it may be maintenance um, agencies that provide support to your not-for-profit um, community service but how do you manage those types of obligations as well? So we're going to actually look at what these are. We're going to walk through what are some of the uh, agreements and letters that we've been using with agencies as well too, to really support them and make sure that they have a clear um, pathway in order to continue to deliver services. So our recommendation around this today is to really look at things like your risk assessment for clients. Um, I will cover what the, we're looking at, or, um, what those mean, but also your service agreements with your contractors. And this is a really big area. Um, it doesn't take a lot of work to actually complete, but certainly as part of that, it is an important process that you need to look at in terms of your key obligations. So today's agenda is we're going to look at some of the service agreements, we're going to look at staff registers, we're going to backtrack over some of the rules as well too because from week to week these are changing and we're seeing these unfold right around the country. I will add that I've had some discussions with CEOs where we're really seeing some of the government public health directives being based on a what I'll call a policy position as opposed to a public health response. So there is this scramble um, that we're seeing by state governments and territory governments to try and reopen as quickly as possible, um, where it's much more of a policy position rather than a, a pub, seemingly a public health response that is being felt with. So we are going to look at, as I've mentioned, some of these service agreements. We're going to look at some of the ways in which agencies have started to engage with contractors um, and actually explain some of the challenges that they have, but also deal with some of the risks that they're also having to deal with right across their own agency networks as well. We're also seeing this across childcare services, 
We're seeing this, as I mentioned, across a whole range of community service agencies. As always, we pay our respects to the elders past and present upon the lands on which we all meet. While this session is being run by webinar, we do pay our respects to the traditional owners accordingly. So as I've mentioned in past webinars, our law firm has been specialises in legal compliance and we've been doing this for over 15 years now. Over the pandemic, we've actually worked with a lot of agencies to set up things like COVID testing services, NDIS, vaccination programs, vaccination clinics, legal agreements, service coordinations, a whole range of um, services to support community service organisations. And this is where we're actually going to base our webinars from to give you some real life case studies of how agencies have addressed some of these problems that you are facing and challenges, um, but also to give you some real life examples of how um, and when and what they've done. So there is a lot of information out there when we're now talking, starting to look at roadmaps and agencies are still very confused around, well, what does this actually mean as we start to get up above 80%? Um, does that still mean that 20% are partially not vaccinated or exempt? We're seeing differences in some different parts of the community. So while there may well be an 80% vaccination rate that the federal and different state governments keep on, I'm going to say, marketing and announcing on the news, there are different pockets of community that are nowhere near that. We're seeing that in some Aboriginal and community controlled organisation communities. We're seeing this in some of the non-English speaking background communities uh, where some population groups are much lower than these rates. But overall, we do acknowledge that the population and the uh, vaccination rates are generally increasing. That being said, there are a range of clients, as I've mentioned, and we're going to go over these slides just to set up the framework of where we're heading for service agreements. But there are essentially a number of different clients that will essentially be visiting your agency or you will be providing services to. So obviously, there will be the clients that are fully vaccinated, that have two the two jabs. Uh, there are the partially vaccinated where they might have one. Um, there may be the exempt people um, that have a, I'll call it a legal exemption that is uh, validated. You'll have people that are not vaccinated. And unfortunately, you may have uh, people that are also COVID positive as part of this group. So with it, whether you are also running group sessions as well too, one of the big challenges that agencies have asked us for is how do we actually screen people and also manage our service agreements with other contractors? And that's what we are going to look at today. Whether you're also visiting clients as well, we work with agencies like the Southern Migrant Resource Center, where they're actually looking at changing their intake process to actually support um, the clients. And I'll show you what some of those questions look like in order to try and actually screen their clients actively over the next few months while these vaccination um, rules are changing. And also to protect their staff to make sure that um, they're doing all what is reasonable under work health and safety obligations as well too. So what does that look like? We'll have a look at that as well. Now, where you are engaging with another agency, and it's particularly, I'll use the examples in, for example, NDIS spaces, where you might use a brokerage arrangement or a contract arrangement to actually deliver services. Um, we've got this challenge where looking at different public health directives, whether it's down in across in South Australia, where the Commissioner of Police actually issues the um, public health directive under the Emergency Management Act, or across New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria, where you can see that it's issued by the Chief Health Officer under the relevant public health and wellbeing legislation. So essentially what we're looking at here is, and uh, stepping through, is the service agreements that relate to your agency. So where you are providing vulnerable uh, services to vulnerable population groups, essentially what you need to look at is, well, how are you actually managing 
your obligations from a service agreement and also for clients. Now with this, let me start with the client side first. Essentially what agencies have started to do is to look at setting up their QR codes um, to then run some contact tracing to support their clients. Now, what do I mean by this? So essentially where this is two streams and we're going to be looking at service agreements shortly with existing contractors. Firstly, we're going to look at how you can provide um, a support network within your agency to essentially screen clients to ensure that um, your staff aren't coming into contact with a COVID positive person or also to track whether people are vaccinated, exempt or not vaccinated. So essentially when we're going in and as part of this, you can actually use this form that I'm showing you here. And if you have a mobile device, you can essentially click on this here and it will bring up a QR code on your mobile device. What it will do, is actually ask you a series of questions. Now, from here, what we have done, and I'll just bring this up here, is actually provide this under a Word document. And agencies have actually completed this and having, star, having clients actually complete this form, whether they're coming in or they, whether staff are going out to visit them in resident, their own residential sites or whether people are coming in. Essentially what this then does, and I'll bring this up, is once you complete it, it brings up a form. Now the form that you can jump into is within your Gemba dashboard. And if we have a look at this here, then essentially the form automatically links in once you complete this, it'll ask you for your name, contact details, um, whether you have had any COVID symptoms and if anybody else is attending with you. Once you complete this form that's there, this will automatically go into your contact tracing space. And if people mark it as yes, it'll automatically send you a notification email. And so it'll also list the date and the time. Now, why is this important when we talk about client screenings as part of the work that you're doing? Now, when we talk of client screenings, essentially what we're looking at is this. If I go back to our presentation, what we've got is essentially people going out to, in this case, visit clients. They complete their screening form, and this is something that is actually being used by the Department of Health in Victoria as an example. And they've asked all agencies that are essential workers to continue to use this daily form. We're finding that migrant resource centers are actually doing this when they go out, or if people are actually even running group classes as well too. And let me bring this up here as a diagram of how this works. So where people are actually coming in and doing group classes, essentially they're completing this form they're screening whether people are actually vaccinated, whether they've got any symptoms, because remember, you can still be a carrier even if you've had the vaccination as well too. So by doing this and actually checking whether people have actually had it, they've then got essentially a register of when people have come in, well, who's actually checked in, and they can go back and make sure that they're services that they're delivering is within a COVID safe space. And essentially by using their contact tracing form that we've got here, it means that you can then set up your own QR codes that you've got. It takes literally seconds for people to actually do. And it means then that you're very quickly able to screen your clients as part of this process. And it's been, this is something that we've seen work within Aboriginal community controlled organisations, refugee services, migrant resource centres as well too, um, even housing and support services with NDIS and also um, women's refuge and alcohol and drug programs as well. So a range of agencies are in fact using this process 
and we and we've actually seen that it actually works and works very very well around this now what we then once we have that process in place one of the things that we have to be conscious of and we're seeing this within public health directives is that document management is now one of the most important things to consider for your agency. In some states, there are state governments, and this is going back a number of years ago, have actually made document management a core requirement under the Crimes Act. And it's important that you actually look at, well, ensure that you're essentially does not, that you do have this specific um, document management requirements and you're keeping information as you need to. Now, we've just had a message from Heidi who's just mentioned uh, my Gemma dashboard doesn't show the COVID safe contact tracing form. Um, Heidi will certainly jump onto that. And if anybody else um, has that in place as well, too, we'll certainly reach out to you and make sure that you've got access to that as well, too. Um, and thank you, Anastasia, we'll follow yourself up as well. So we'll certainly look at that as part of that process as well. Normally, you'll find that after each webinar that we do run, we open up another part of the Gemba dashboard. Um, so that way, you're able to actually jump in and actually have a look at it as well, too. So we'll certainly follow those up if you don't have access to those. So with a as part of the service agreements and why we're starting to look at service agreements is that under the respective public health directions, whether, as I mentioned, whether you're based in South Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, um, and whether it's actually coming from the under the commissioner of police in South Australia or the chief health officer in other states, essentially people are looking at, well, what does it mean to be an authorised provider under the public health directives. So essentially, this is where your agency may have contracts with other providers. So there's a number of ways to actually deal with these very key issues. But essentially, what we're looking at here, and this is the key part for many service agencies that we've provided legal advice to, is to look at what we call three different areas for your pandemic vaccination um, and public health directives. There's what we call force majeure clauses, which is in the event that something major happens, a policy change and indemnity cover for your agency. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, essentially, with any service agreement that you have or contract agreement, there are really three things that you need to look at and we've divided them here. Essentially, what we're looking at having is to have service agreements change and also indemnity cover and policy positions change. Now, these are just two very basic examples of clauses that we put out for agencies, but equally, this is where there are some changes specifically to contracts that you need to consider as part of your contractual obligations. So the first one is around what we call force majeure events. Now, force majeure events is, I'm going to say, just a fancy name of essentially saying, um, well, what that essentially, that what it means is essentially an unforeseeable circumstance that prevents someone for, for, from fulfilling a contract. So in this case, when we're looking at this, there are pandemic clauses that we add in. Um, there are things quite legitimately like lockdowns where state governments have said um, in the past it's going to be used as a tool. We're seeing it now that governments are very hesitant in doing it. But what we are seeing is local hospital networks and areas that they may lock down classrooms individually and the likes. So essentially, uh, force majeure or essentially will include things like um, act of God clauses where it is around um, lightning strikes and floods and tsunamis. And before COVID, people just used to have it as, um, you know, pandemic um, listed as a uh, force majeure event. But what does it actually mean? Well, it actually means that essentially there are interruptions that cause this. And so both yourself and the contractor may also need to look at, well, what do we actually need to do to in order where we do have pandemic um, issues that are causing disruption of our services. So essentially we change the pandemic clauses 
to essentially add in what each of your agency and contractors are going to do. Equally, what we also then add in is to say, look, that your agency is an essential service, being a, uh, providing services to vulnerable members of the community. And again, what is the contractor going to do to meet these requirements? Equally, we've also put in insurance and indemnity clauses, um, which we classify as a bit of a policy change, is to say that the contractor will actually maintain appropriate insurance and indemnify your agency against any costs associated which under their liability. And it could actually be things like mandatory vaccinations. So if you have a contractor, like a security company, for example, that you're in fact using, and they and they come onto your site and you're a disability service provider or you're a um, healthcare worker service or you're a food service or the likes, then again, you want to make sure that those people aren't actually um, bringing unvaccinated people onto your workplace. And so this is where these types of clauses come in. Now, what we have done to show you what this actually looks like in I'm going to say in real life around this, is essentially bring up a document like this. At the very least, what we have put in is to pull up the relevant um, vaccination requirements under public health directive. This is one I've spoken about, the South Australian one, um, and also Queensland as well. This is now the Victorian type of letter form as well too. But essentially, it's a, it's a letter that goes out to your contractors, and it is a template letter. Uh, but essentially, it outlines the authorised worker rules and the public health directives. It outlines the areas and what your requirements are, but also then provides, as I've just listed here, what are the specific requirements that your agency needs to meet around this as well too. Now, in some cases, we've actually specified that they do need to have their workforce vaccination status um, confirmed and also provide this back to yourselves as a validation that they do have these particular requirements in place. And as part of this, it's a simple form letter, but, and this is really used for agencies under NDIS or aged care type of services or food bank services, where there is another agreement that sits behind this. So this is almost, I'll call it a bit of a Band-Aid solution until the next time you have your review of your contract and then you'd actually look to insert some of these clauses into your contract as well too. So with it, as you're going through these types of service agreements reviews, it's important that you actually start to specify this information and also ensure that your indemnity requirements are met as well. Now, the other parts that we will just briefly look at today is around things like your um, risk registers. And the risk registers, if I head back to the dashboard, what you will find again on your Gemba dashboard is the capacity around managed starting to look at your risk reporting. Now, the risk reporting you'll find is um, located next to the HR management, and we've got that listed here under a risk register. So the risk register, when you open this up, and again, this can be used for things like to meet your quality standards, that's relevant to your specific agency as well too. Um, and also things like um, specific compliance reporting um, as part of your governance standards for your directors as well. This is something we're going to start to unpack a bit more next week as we move through this. Uh, but essentially, I just want to draw your attention to the risk registers because it is something that will actually prompt you as part of the workforce requirements as well. So with it, as you're moving through your compliance and service agreements, um, you can see that you've got your HR registers, which you can use for your contractors as well too. So if I bring up the HR side, you'll find, and let me just refresh the page for us as well too, um, you will find that under your HR recruitment section as well, um, you can go in and actually add in your contractor information. So as these letters and um, service agreements are coming back, you can actually go in and actually add in your relevant contractors that you do work under your HR space as well too. And this does allow you to manage all of your contractor reporting and actually look at their vaccination status 
within your agency. So you've essentially got all of your documentation in one spot and rather than having it on Excel spreadsheets and having it um, as on a separate file somewhere else, this essentially allows you to manage it all in one space directly off your Gemba dashboard. And I'm just getting some questions of how did I get back there? So essentially, once you go into your Gemba dashboard, um, you will find that it's listed under the HR space. And once we click on the HR button, this screen will come up. And if you wanted to add a new person in, you can simply click on add. What I will do is let me call set up. Okay, I'm gonna set up um, Jane Citizen, for example. And in this case, I'm gonna mark that in this case, Jane is a contractor. I can click on save and here comes Jane's profile up now as well. From here, I can then go into the section that allows me to manage whether Jane is uh, fully vaccinated, unvaccinated or exempt as well. And I'm just gonna mark that Jane is vaccinated here. In this case, Jane has had the, I know has had the vaccine from last week. And then what I'm going to do is simply mark in that it's due again as a reminder in 12 months time. And once I click on save, that comes up from here. From here, I can then obviously run my reports directly. And if I wanted to click on reports, I can then click on run and I've got the um, check here and I can view that directly here as well too across it. So very, very quickly, I can actually run any of the reports that I need to across this system. So from a service agreement point of view, as your contractors are coming back to you with their documentation, this allows you to manage your direct reports as well. So our recommendations is to look at the screening registers for clients and the staff vaccination registers. As I mentioned next week, we are going to start to look at running events and group sessions for classes as well too. Um, and with it, how do you actually manage this process as well? There are a few questions um, with it. Um, I can see that Heidi's just asked another question, just saying, can the HR management system be used instead of needing a risk register. Yes, that's correct, Heidi. Um, you can as well too. The HR system is there and I know um, you've been loading information in as we discussed um, earlier this week. The HR side is there certainly. Um, the risk register is more of a task menu to say how have you actually manage this. Um, it's not to create more work. It's essentially um, there as the reminder as part of that process. So certainly the HR register is where you would keep all of your um, contractors, staff, and other information from the HR perspective. And it allows you to manage all of that um, with your COVID registers. And as you know, even upload um, uh, what I'll call vaccination certificates and the likes as well. Um, if you do have any questions, by all means, um, after today's session, by all means, please reach out directly on the mobile, which is 0413 699 515 or you can reach out to us directly on 1300 360 360 or email us at support at gemba360.com. As always, we will stay on the line and answer any questions that you might have. If you are watching this webinar after today's live session and want to get copies of the resources or the likes, then by all means, please reach out to us directly on 1300 360 360 or email us at support at gemba360.com.